Radio Free Santa Clarita presents The Talk of Santa Clarita A podcast about issues involving Santa Clarita and the surrounding valley Episode 131 Republican candidate for the 25th Congressional District Mark Kripe And now, let's see what the talk of Santa Clarita is. And remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. Okay, uh, Mark Kripe. Is that, is, am I pronouncing it correctly, Kripe? You are. I wasn't, when I first saw the name listed, I thought, my, was it Kripey or Kripe or, you know? I've been it? called all kinds of things. What, what, are the, what are the origins of that name? Where's that from? It's you know? made up. <laughs> it's a made up name so my ancestor Jacob Greib mm -hmm. G-R-I-B-E came here in 1722 okay um, for whatever reason mm -hmm. uh, that is the origin of the name change okay whether people couldn't understand his thick Germanic accent or whatever but so every Kripe in the United States mm -hmm. comes from him okay uh, there's a lot of us now <laughs> A lot, yeah. <clears throat> especially on the East Coast. Like you go to northern Indiana, mm -hmm. there's a lot of cripes. Not so much on the West Coast. Right. But yeah, yeah. so okay. it's a made-up name. Yeah. Um, Jacob came from what we would call Bern, Switzerland today. Okay, all right, all right. Um, okay, and um, let, first of all, how, how's the campaign going for you for, uh, start off? Let's... Well, I, I, this is the first campaign I've ever ran, so... You, you've never run for anything ever? Um, uh, I did a Quartz Hill Town Council thing once, mm -hmm. told uh, the town wanted me to run, people in the town. Yeah. I told them I don't want a campaign. They said, I'll put my name in the hat, but I don't want a campaign. They said, okay, we'll, we'll campaign for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I won that. Uh, it's a little town election, so it's not like a big, right, a big right. thing. But, but, but there is that old <clears throat> story of the guy who doesn't really want to be elected, doesn't want to do any of the work, and always ends up elected. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I took 92% of the vote on that. Wow. And wow. so um, that became kind of a, you know, a, a learning curve in that. Mm -hmm. uh, in small town politics, uh, I'm like, yeah, I just want to get things done for the town. Mm hmm I'm not into who's better than who thing. Yeah. Um, we did accomplish a few things, mm -hmm. but there was just way too much infighting to, for my liking. And so uh, this is my next one. So the, your question, how's the campaign going? Yeah. Um, if you look at it based on traditional things, mm -hmm. um, I'm getting my butt kicked. <laughs> well, let, let's so, be honest. You are a bit of an underdog. When you say, wait, oh, I knew yeah, that. I knew yeah. that before I actually threw my name in the hat for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked to my Republican consultants. There's no big surprise here. We were coming in late, right? Um, in a crowded field, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, but uh, I'm having a lot of fun talking mm -hmm. to folks. Uh, wrestling with different concepts. You know, my goal is to change the conversation, which I'm sure we will discuss today. Mm -hmm. uh, there's too, too many important topics right. that we are arguing like uh, teenagers. Okay. You know. Well, what, 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 we'll get into that, but I, I'm curious, you know, what was the motivation to actually uh, decide to, I'm going to throw my hat in the, in the uh, race and uh, see what happens? There's a few times in my life where I've, I've felt like that, we will just call it the still small voice. Mm -hmm. um, this was one of them. I fought it. Uh, we prayed about it. I talked. I sought a lot of counsel. Talked to a lot of different people. Their their feedback was, "Yeah, I think you should be in this race. You know, give the voters a choice." Mm -hmm. I heard all this feedback, and so here I am. I put my name in the hat. But I mean, there there had to been a motivation beyond that. I mean, what? I mean, was there a feeling that? I can fix this, or I want to fix this, or this is going wrong, or... Um, okay, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, good point, Stephen. So, if, if we keep boiling that down, yeah. um, I'm a Marine, mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Sheriff. I've sworn to protect the Constitution twice, right? I took right. that oath. And so, when I look at some of these individuals 
arguing for socialism in our country. Okay. That does not sit well with me. Mm-hmm. Can't I can't go there. I've been to a socialist country. I've been my wife and I were momentarily detained in socialist or communist Hungary. Wow. So um, my wife had a, a miscarriage while we were on our backpack trip. We experienced socialized medicine back then in those countries. It's not. It's just not this great thing. And so when the people are are, are championing this idea, uh, well, who's championing it? What, tell well, me. Bernie Sanders, AOC. Right. There's several of them that are championing. And when you watch the debates, mm-hmm. you know every time they talk about free things. The free things, giving the free things. Right. It's a form of socialism. It's a form of using taxpayers' money uh, to give people benefits instead of just having them work or have capitalism or competition drive it. Every time the government gets involved, every time the government gets involved, you see a degrade in whatever that is. Do you like uh, having a fire department? Uh, I do like having a fire department. Do like I having, do like having law enforcement. Yeah, okay. There's that, are, that, there that, are certain things. That, that, that could be construed as socialism. Uh, I mean... True. Uh, it could be. Yeah. Uh, public roads, public education. Now, the public roads, see, here's, here's a good thing where it's gone mm-hmm. bad, right? Okay. Because we're paying a lot of money in our gas taxes, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that are upset about the condition of the roads. Yeah. So the people are paying for it, but mm-hmm. they're not getting it. Where's that money going? Well, the government... Decided that our, our road money, allegedly, I'm going to say allegedly because I don't have any documentation, but right. where did that money go? People assume it went to the bullet train right. in that mess, but our roads are not getting fixed to the, to the level people feel that they're paying for. Right. Now, I've been to some pretty rough countries. Our roads are still pretty nice, I'm going to tell you right now, comparatively, but... Uh, you know, we get used to but really I, nice I'll roads. Give, I'll give you, I'll give you the, that, that California does not have the best uh, infrastructure when it comes to uh, freeways and stuff like well, that. Well, they're so, rough. I mean, I, yeah. I ride a motorcycle, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, with our motorcycle, when you're riding a motorcycle, you've got to really, really pay attention because you can literally, even on a freeway where you think a freeway is nice, there's some big, big holes yeah. that will just yeah. swallow a motorcycle tire. The first time I... Because I'm from Kentucky, and one of the biggest things they spend money on in the state is is, is freeways, you know. And uh, uh, so I I, I, I crossed the state line, and I'm driving into L.A., and I kept thinking, do I have a flat tire? And and I kept, I even stopped and pulled over and <laughs> looked <laughs> and everything, <laughs> but it was the road itself was just so bad. And I wasn't used to something like that, you know. Uh, so I understand what you're talking about. So the worst roads I've been on to date are in Ireland, but bad, bad. <laughs> oh my, <Yeah. laughs> they're pretty um, bad. So uh, let's 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 uh, talk a little bit about you as a person. Let's get get your background so uh, find out a little bit about you. Uh, uh, born and raised where? Uh, born born in Glendale, California. Okay, a Barron's Hospital. It's mm-hmm. now gone. They okay. took that down. I uh, was raised in Shadow Hills, mm-hmm. which is in between Sun Valley and Sullendahunga, just over the hill. All right. Uh, probably not far from where Suzette was. I think my mom and dad's house was maybe three or four miles from the epic center of the 71 quake. Oh, okay. So, wow. So definitely felt that bad boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, went to Verdugo Hills High School, Mount Gleason High School, went to Stone, you know, blah, 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 or the junior high, Mount Gleason Junior High, Verdugo High School. Grew up, uh, I'm the last of five. Wow. Uh, but I grew up kind of like an only child. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about uh, dysfunction, mm-hmm. m- my family definitely had, had dysfunction. But so my two older sisters, Linda and Karen, mm-hmm. were out of the house, and Karen already had a son by the time I was born. Wow. So my mom was a grandmother. When you were born. When yeah. I was born. Wow, yeah. Okay. And, and uh, you will talk a little bit because Troy. Karen's oldest and I grew up like brothers. Mm-hmm. We went in the Marine Corps together under the wow. buddy system. Okay. Okay. And the drill instructors just couldn't figure that out. <laughs> right? they, they kept calling us inbred white boys. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and, and then so you, you enlisted it. I, I, the, um, your website on your bio was a little vague about your family life and stuff like that. It, it, I think it actually uses the term broken home, doesn't it, or something like that? Or Probably dysfunctional, dysfunctional broken. Yeah. yeah, it depends on which bio you go to or who yeah. wrote it. Uh, or who rewrote it sometimes, but yeah, it was it was a, a, a the closest sibling to me was ten years older than me. So Linda, my oldest sister, she's seventy five. Wow. Okay. Okay. So she's she's. And how old are you? I am fifty four. Fifty four. Okay. I know I look like I'm you know in my thirties, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, anyway, got out of uh, high school early. I graduated at 17. My mom put me in school early, mm-hmm. I think, just to get, you know, poof. I think <laughs> I think mom was pretty done raising kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad was 47. Mm. So imagine, you know, being right. 40. Imagine being 50 and having a three-year-old. Yeah, it, can't it, imagine. It, yeah I, I don't think I was the most popular thing in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, but I graduated high school. Uh, I was I, I moved out at 17. I moved out before I graduated high school. Mm-hmm. Graduated high school. Wasn't going anywhere pretty much real fast. Mm-hmm. And I, I realized that. So Troy came knocking on my door and said, hey, well, let's go to the Marine Corps together. All right, you know, so we prayed about it, I prayed about it. You know, it was, it was an intimidating thing, but I go, mm. well, if you're gonna go in the military, you might as well try to be the best. Sure. So we went in, took the test. Our, our recruiter wanted us to go in OCS. We scored high, Troy and I mm. both scored high enough on our ASVAB to, mm. anyway, we didn't want that. We wanted to go fight, you know, we were, go be 0311s. What year was this? I mean, what, did you actually Eight, uh, 82, action? 1982, yeah, okay. no. Um, it was Reagan. We, were, we yeah. became Reagan Marines. So uh, the only really big thing that happened during the Reagan era, military-wise, that, that I'm aware of, uh, is our barracks got blown up. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, we became uh, part of the UN peacekeeping force over there, mm-hmm. uh, which goes to show you that the issues in the Middle East have been going on for a long, long time. They always have, yes. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, Grenada, Grenada. I know Grenada, yeah. Grenada went down. Yeah. Uh, my unit got caught up in doing a post Grenada action, like a training scenario, mm-hmm. but we weren't. We didn't get any piece of that. So anyway, uh, went in the Marine Corps. So you, were, how, how long were you in the Marine Corps? For? I was in six years, but it's important everyone understands. I went in a reserve program. Mm-hmm. So you go in, you, you're active duty, you, you earn your title, you go to your military occupation specialty, and then you report to your reserve fleet. So. I did six years yeah. uh, and was out as an E5 honorably. But I'll talk about there's college time. There's other things I did mm-hmm. while I was doing my, my commitment. Yeah. And then you know I went to college and I did some other stuff. So yeah. What did you uh, major in school, in college? I started with psychology and sociology. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I, I changed that up. Well, I went from a secular school to Biola, uh, Christian college, Christian university. So when I went to the uh, Christian University, I switched to Camp and Rex as a minor and Christian education as my major. Christian education. Okay. Uh, I'm getting the impression you're a religious man. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, religious. I mean, I, I have a strong belief in, in God and in, uh, in that past. The only thing I don't like about the whole religious thing is because a lot of times it's associated with just tradition. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, try to, I try to actually live some of these things I learned as a young man. So, I mean, you go to church on regular? Uh, as regular as I can. Uh, my wife and I spent a significant amount of time unchurched for a while. Mm-hmm. So, and don't, I am not a, not the saint. I'm not, I'm, you know, I don't tell people, hey, you know, do this. I don't judge people. Right. I'm pretty much, uh, m- my faith's about my walk. All right, what, uh, do you mind if I ask what denomination you are? It's Christian, Christian. but non, non-denominational. Non-denominational, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you're married. How long have you been married? Uh, I've been married 31 years. Wow. My wife and I dated for two. So we, my wife and I have been together for 33 years, uh-huh. which I think I've been with my wife longer than some of the other candidates who have been alive. <laughs> I think that might be true. <laughs> uh, Same okay. wife, one wife. You'll hear me make jokes sometimes. It's like, yeah, I decided to keep my starter wife. She turned out pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did um, and and how did you end up in the twenty uh, fifth uh, district living out this way? Where do you live? You live in Palmdale, is that right? Or well, I live uh, I live in the courts area, West Palmdale, okay. uh, that area. So yeah, how did we end up there? Uh, fate, I guess. One thing, um, I was working for a contractor. Mm-hmm. I, that I, framing was my bread and butter mm-hmm. early on. So uh, my Boy Scout troop leader was a contractor. And he taught, he started teaching me how to frame it when I was fourteen. Okay. Um, he bought me my first set of nail bags and and whatnot, and I would trade hours for learning. Right. So he wasn't paying me, but I was learning. Anyway, so by the time I'm twenty two, I was a foreman. Mm-hmm. And uh, Randy lived out here. Randy Crosby, Crosby Construction. He lived out out here. So when Mel and I were, were obviously committed to getting married, 
where are we going to live? Where could, we, where could a young couple even afford right. uh, at the end of the 80s? And so uh, I got an apartment uh, in November of 87 at Mountain Shadows there off Avenue S. And as they say, you know, once you start putting down roots, uh, but that's where it was. We commuted every day. Randy and I drove back down. We building in Malibu and in Beverly Hills and whatnot. Mm-hmm. We, I got some. I got some work up here later on, yeah. locally, which was nice. But <clears throat> that's it was basically economics that yeah. that's landed us. How most people end up here. <laughs> I wanted to move to Colorado. Oh, I wanted you? to get married and get the heck out of California back mm-hmm. then. Uh, but my wife did not want to go that far away from her family, which I, gotcha. I respected and said okay. How long, how long have you lived in uh, this area, this district? Uh, since 1987, except for when we were in Europe. And even home, when we were homeless, it was in this district. So You were homeless? Yes. How long were you homeless? Eight months. Wow. Were, while you were married? Mm-hmm. How and, that... and still married. <laughs> still <laughs> the <married>? same woman. <laughs> My wife's a hero. I, I, how did that happen? Do you want to talk about it a little bit? Or? Yeah, no one did anything dastardly to us. Mm-hmm. Um, it's my wife and I took a risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went all in on that risk. So we, okay, this, 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 and this is going to happen. So what we did, uh, we, we had an opportunity of a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And we sat down, you're newly married. Are you married? Yes. Okay, you're newly married. You know, what are your dreams? What do you want to do? And I mean, you talk about when you're dating, but when you're married, now it's serious. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, you, now you got to get a, a pad out and start making a bucket list with your yeah, wife. Yeah. So you can work on it. So traveling was one of our top top bucket list things and so Melanie got hired uh, by the University of New Orleans to be the exchange nurse uh, in Innsbruck Mm -hmm. so that was the catalyst that was like the okay that that we're halfway there now you know and so we went all in we sold everything we owned, and we backpacked across 13 countries Wow. And uh, during that process, I mean, I, I tell people one of the smartest decisions I made was I bought the return airfare mm-hmm. back to L.A. before we left. <laughs> so I knew I had to just get to, to London on this day to this time, mm-hmm. get in line, get on the plane, and I can get home. Right. And uh, we pretty much, it was pretty much right down to like the last little bit of food, last bit of money. Mm-hmm. You know, here's my plane ticket. Yeah, let's get home. But when we came back here, we, we knew we'd have no money. Mm-hmm. So uh, a gentleman that we knew said, hey, you can, you can live on my lot. He had a lot out, out in Yano off of Panorama Road. Nothing on it, just, mm-hmm. just land. Um, he didn't want a tent, so we had to acquire basically an Indian teepee. Uh, and it had you know, just a dirt floor. And there's no water, electricity out there, no bathroom. And uh, that, was, that was home. So theoretically, I was houseless, not homeless. Wow. Uh, we lived through the winter in that thing. Uh, and it snowed quite a bit out there. Wow. Uh, I would get our water. Uh, off, there's a gas station on 138. Mm-hmm. I would go down there periodically and fill our water jugs up. Uh, the gas station tent would let me fill the water jugs up with their hose. You know, the, the little hose that mm-hmm. you'd get radiator water from? Right. That's where I got water to eat, wash, drink. Mm-hmm. That's where we got it from. So... Did- uh, I have to ask, though. I mean, you were you were homeless, so I mean, were you using any government government assistance? Nope. No food stamps, nope. nothing like that to help you. Why not? I mean, it, it's there. Uh, your tax dollars pay for it. Uh, I mean, that's what it's there for, right? It's a safety net. Yeah, my 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 family's basically you work for what you get. Mm-hmm. My my family's was the the ethics or morals that I was taught by my parents. Remember, they're they're the, the greatest generation, right? They, yeah. they went through the Depression. They went through World War II. They went, going without mm-hmm. was just part and parcel of their life. Right. So those values they passed down to me is you work hard for whatever you get. Uh, don't take handouts. Don't, you know, you... So how did you eat? What, 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 what did you do for an income? What, what, well, I did handyman work. Like if I could find anybody that would, would needed anything, I mean, yeah. I, could, I could do a bunch of stuff. I right. had skills, right. thank goodness. Um, the vineyard church, the Desert Vineyard Church, uh, through friends of ours, gave us a car. Okay, okay, but see that, what is the difference though, accepting the car from the church and not taking food stamps from, uh, or taking food stamps from the government? Well, first of all, I believe if we can help each other's neighbors mm-hmm. through church, charity, whatnot, I would rather keep the government out of all that. 
I would rather, I, if somebody chooses to be charitable, mm-hmm. that's different than me taking your money and I decide where charity is going to go. See, if you keep your money and you decide, well, you want to help, you want to help me, you help me. Right. Right. And that builds a relationship between you and me. If you and I give our money to the government because it's taxed, mm-hmm. and then the government decides where that money is going to go, mm-hmm. it's like, well, sometimes it goes to good places. Okay. Right. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and say, well, all welfare is bad. Mm-hmm. I, that's the, there's people that need help. Sure. There's people that need Absolutely. help. No, I have no problem with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would probably give those people some of my own money, and I have. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but then. As a deputy sheriff, I've arrested people that have four, five, six social security numbers. Okay, why do you have those many social security numbers if you're not defrauding something? Well, in our I mean, in, in a program, in welfare programs, particularly for something like the United States, I mean, you're going to find fraud in, in almost any program. Yeah, and, and that's to, why I'm like, that, you know? I would love to have more accountability in the welfare. I'm not saying get rid of it because there's there's people that truly need it. Yeah, trust me, I've seen them. Right. Okay. I probably was one of them in reality, yeah. but that's not what we what we did. We 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 worked our own way through it, um, and there's something to be said about that. I think for, as far as at least for a, a man, sometimes working our own way through it, we go without or whatever. Uh, it's just it helps our own self worth. Does it change? It changes your perspective. I assume I, you know it makes you appreciate things a little bit more. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, without a doubt. Now. I didn't come from a wealthy family to start with, yeah. and camping wasn't that, you know, you can say, well, we were just camping, long-term camping, in, in one sense of your mind, right? It depends how the optics you look no, at. I, my optics is hell. So, uh, <laughs> any, anything to do with camping at all is hell. So, um, anyway. Well, I did ahead. a lot of camping in the Marine Corps. Right. That's why I'm not a Marine. The whole, the whole latr- latrine thing right there threw me off. So, you know. Oh, like, yeah. Um, I was talking with somebody... Uh, and I said, well, my wife and I have had some unique arguments for a couple. Yeah. And, you know, they were going, well, everybody has different kind of I said, yeah. I said, my wife would be, we would say, what bush did you use last? Mm-hmm. And they're looking at me like, what? I said, you know, yeah, well, you have no outhouse. Um, you're basically cat trenching it, you know. <laughs> and uh, where, you, where you went last becomes yeah. uh, important information. Right. And uh, anyway, so... Uh, we went through that, and it was our own choosing. See, no one did it to us. Yeah. Not blaming anybody. We knew that was a risk. Uh, the car that the church gave us was, uh, it was a rough car. Um, <laughs> I'm thankful for it, but it was a rough car. Yeah. Uh, it was a, a two-door red hatchback thing. And uh, it was, it, the tabs were still valid, mm-hmm. okay? But there's no registration in the car. Okay. I couldn't tell you who the car was registered to. Mm-hmm. All the locks had been punched for whatever reason, and you had to start the car with a screwdriver. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I sh- what a responsible person should have done, I should have got a little note from the church saying they donated this thing to me. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have any of that, right? I'm just driving this car, thankful that somebody gave it to me, fat, yeah. dumb, and happy. Um, it wasn't until I became a deputy sheriff that I realized, oh my gosh, is, you know, by the grace of God, there go I. Uh, that was a, a perfect, what we would call a reasonable cause, grand theft auto arrest. Right. I, mean, I probably would have arrested myself in that car, truth be told. How, no. let's, let's, I, I wanna, I, I'm cu- just curious about the sheriff's deputy thing. How, how long have you been a sheriff's deputy? Uh, I retired in March, and I will finish out 29 years. 29 years. You enjoyed it? Uh, I guess, uh, I mean, what motivated you to become a sheriff's deputy? <clears throat> Money. Okay. Well, that's some brutal honesty there. It's, yeah. um, my wife was pregnant. Mm-hmm. Uh, construction out here just took a dump. Yeah. I mean, just took a huge dump. There was a lot of pressure. My wife's putting pressure on me. You know, mm-hmm. I had, we had bills now. Cause we'd moved in uh, a little a little building, a little rental apartment thing mm-hmm. way on on the west side. I mean, we went from the teepee on the east side way to the west side. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, yeah, I had to, I had to get work and. And they were hiring. In fact, you would laugh at this because I go in to the sheriff's department and uh, they got two applications on the counter. And so I went in to apply to be a facilities management guy. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I have a construction background. Right. And so I have all this. I, I ran crews, for heaven's sakes, in, in big, big homes. Well, they said I didn't have enough experience, if I remember right, in plumbing. Mm. Okay, I didn't have enough plumbing experience. So I didn't qualify, you know, and that job made like, I don't know, at the time, maybe 
thirty-five thousand a year mm-hmm. or something, and I could be off on those numbers. So, right. you know, but it, at the time it was a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. I didn't qualify for. It. So I look over at this stack of papers and I go, well, what? What's this? What's this stack? Mm-hmm. And they go, listen, deputy sheriff. I go, well, what do I need for that? And they go, you just need a high school diploma. <clears throat> I go, oh. I go, how much does that pay? And it's like double what this job was. Uh, I'm like, yeah, give me that application. <laughs> I'll take gotcha, that. I got gotcha. you. And so uh, I never had, I tell you, I never had a desire to be a cop. There's a lot of guys that that was their life dream. Hmm. I became uh, a law enforcement officer. And I chose the sheriff's department when they were hiring, too, is uh, two men in my Boy Scout troop were deputies. I got gotcha. you. And they were iconic to me. So I'm like, yeah, okay, I think I'll, I'll go do that. So uh, the sheriff's department's been really good to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, the experiences in the sheriff's department have been rough, been brutal. How so? Um, you see things, you experience things that most human minds can't reconcile. But you're, you're not, you're retired, right? So you're, you're not, not yet. I retire in March. Okay. Oh, in March. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've got a few. I was, I was hoping to get some dirt on on what's going on in, in the sheriff's department in general. So. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, I love. I love my department. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, I get to work for the biggest sheriff's department in the world. Yeah. Um, do we have problems? Absolutely, we got problems. Yeah. Just like everything else. Like, that's why you're probably going to try to hammer me on other issues. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't have a perfect country. We don't have a perfect state. And we don't sure. have a perfect sheriff's department. Well, no, I mean, but <clears throat> Lee Baca, there, I mean, a lot of, there's been a lot of controversy about when he was running the sheriff's department for as long as he did. Um, well, that was pretty normal now, remember? Block... Block ran it for a long time. Mm. Pitches ran it for a long time. Yeah. Historically, in fact, historically, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, for my career, 29 years, to have five sheriffs, I'm going to have work for five sheriffs, right. that's abnormal. Yeah. We've, in, the, in the, what, <clears throat> 150 years, the sheriff's department, 150 years mm-hmm. plus, that many sheriffs is abnormal. Yeah. Well, I mean, but there have been, like, uh, you know, allegations of uh, racism and... Uh, Oh, the absolutely. treatment of, the, of, of uh, arrestees and things like that. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it, the sheriff's department does kind of have a bad reputation in, in, in this county, unfortunately. In, in some places. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, the, the, the guys that I work with in the period of time I work mm-hmm. patrol, because I only yeah. work patrol for three, three and a half years. Yeah. Okay. Um, a real short time comparison to some of these other fellows. Right. Uh, well, fellows and gals. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The, the folks that I work with have been very, very professional mm-hmm. and not, there wasn't any of that stuff. You hear the allegations. Now, am I privy to cases where some knucklehead deputy said something or did something that was stupid? Absolutely. It's there. Yeah. I would like to believe they're somewhat isolated or random mm-hmm. or rare opposed to this, this whole ideology, the undercurrent ideology within a station. Yeah. Like now you see East L.A., right? Our new sheriff's going through East L.A., and, and there's some issues there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, <clears throat> that stuff's always been around right. my entire career. Mm-hmm. Baca was dealing with the regulators and, and uh, the Reapers and all that down south. Right. Uh, so I think every sheriff is going to have to deal with that. It's, you can't allow people to begin to emulate the very morals, ethics, values, behaviors of those that you're trying to please. I got you. I got you. Ex- ex- the, on the negative end, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, my take is, man, I'm so thankful that I got hired by the sheriff's board. They told me I wouldn't get hired, by the way, when I right. first applied. They said, there's no way, you know. I mean, and I get it, right? Mm-hmm. I, had, I had a lot of jobs. I'm coming out of homelessness. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, where were you for this year? Well, I was just living in a teepee. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, we was out here on Panorama Road, and I was seeing I was in Europe, and and uh, so the first sergeant that talked to me just said, "You might as well quit. We're not hiring you." Yeah. And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. Right. Right. I'm gonna do my best." And uh, the sergeant that picked up my background mm-hmm. ended up liking me. Completely honest with him, whatever he asked, and, yeah. and I said, "Yeah, here's here's what it, what it is." And so there's no for me there's no benefit of lying. Yeah. It, you know and. I don't want to gain anything falsely. That, that right. goes back to kind of that old-fashioned um, things my my folks taught me. But uh, yeah, so we were that, we were homeless. Took us eight months to get out of that. 
uh, the car was a godsend because yeah. we could start moving. And once I could start, I'd get more jobs. Right. Once we can get enough, enough saved up to get this little house that we did uh, and get an electric clock that had an alarm, it's little things. You don't realize yeah, there's little I, I've, things. I've worked with homeless. I, I mean, it was one of those things that when I started talking to uh, uh, some of the uh, clients that I uh, worked with, you know, they would talk about like, well, yeah, get a job's great, but you know, who's going to wake you up to get to get you there? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, little things that yeah. you just don't realize. You know, the we have the sheriff's department has the the host team now. It's a homeless yeah. outreach team, and, and those deputies have come and talked to me because they they knew I was I was homeless one time. I said, you want to be like a a hero? You want to help bridge gaps? I go having your black and white. Extra bottles of water and toilet paper. <laughs> I, yeah, okay. yeah. You know, people. I guarantee most of your listeners take the toilet paper for granted. Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and now you work uh, with at risk at risk youth, right? I mean, what what is it you do exactly with that? So uh, in uh, ninety nine, mm-hmm. December fifteenth, nineteen ninety nine. I got picked to start uh, one of several sites, brand new program called VITA, mm-hmm. Vital Intervention Direction Alternatives. The, uh, the captain of Lancaster Station at the time was uh, Captain Pickett. Uh, he came out and did a ride along on early morning. So everyone's like, what's the captain doing there? You know? mm-hmm. Oh, he's riding with you, right? But I'm like, oh. Anyway, we talked about this thing and, and he ended up picking me to, to do that. So uh, I had 30 days to start a site. Uh, we did it with, uh, at the UCAN building there. Uh, Palmdale kicked in a deputy named Deputy Johnny Jones, uh, and then Lancaster finally kicked in a second deputy, uh, Liz Shepard. And the three of us basically just built uh, the Vita site for the Antelope Valley out. Well, what does it do? I mean, tell me, tell me <clears> So it's program. a 16-week program. It works with male and females between 11 and 17 and a half. Uh, we, we target, and I, I don't want to use that word target, um, we focus on uh, kids that are medium to high risk. And when we talk about high risk, we're talking about the level of probability of them offending or reoffending. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, that's our target group. Kids that are, are lower risk, we, we won't take in because academia says um, you'll probably make these kids worse. By taking in, what do you mean? Do you, like, uh, enroll them. Enroll, enroll them to the program. program. Yeah, we'll refer the lower risk kids out to like YL or mm-hmm. Young Marines. And I mean, there's a lot of great programs out there in the community. So, but we work with this group. And so this group, usually it's, they're getting kicked out of school. Some of them have already been adjudicated, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the court uh, has sent them to us sometimes. Probation has sent them to them sometimes. Sometimes their defense attorneys sent them to us, right. believe it or not. Um, pre-adjudicated kids uh, will come to us. Uh, a lot of times the court will be more lenient if they're already enrolled in VITA. Mm-hmm. Schools will send them to us. Parents bring them. And so we just get this, we got this, spectrum that people come and so our whole goal is to redirect that life Mm -hmm. our whole goal we're not there to incarcerate these kids we have the power to do it right okay that's the that's a beautiful thing yeah we probably arrest more adults around these kids than we do the kids because what what we do is is there's an assessment that we have it's about an hour hour and a half assessment we Mm -hmm. set parent and child down um and it's a it's a clinical assessment that's designed to be conducted by lay people, mm-hmm. right? So deputy sheriffs, most of my deputies, I mean, I, we have deputy sheriffs that have master's and doctorate degrees, but most of them aren't clinical right. psychologists. So uh, this program, we use this program, and, it, and it'll tell you, okay, here's the areas the kid's high in, high risk in, and, and, uh, and then we kind of build out a case plan, mm-hmm. case management plan off of that. So, uh, you know, we use Ed Latesse's um, crimogenic reasons, the, the causations for delinquent behavior, crime causing, crimogenics, mm-hmm. crime causing. Okay. Uh, and then um, it goes for 16 weeks. We do all kinds of stuff. We have the kids uh, Saturdays for eight hours. Uh, we have the parents and the child midweek for midweek counseling. Uh, one of the great things I love that we did is we got uh, Chicago School of Psychology uh, and we wrote a practicum program for their doctoral students. Wow. Nice. So their doctoral students get uh, credit, mm-hmm. right, for, for being enrolled in our practicum. We get uh, mental health services for these families that don't cost anybody a dime. Hmm. 
so and then the, the students the practicum students are supervised by PhDs at, at the school okay. so uh, what that does is it gives any any family that goes into a crisis or, or is experiencing a crisis while they're enrolled in Vita at any time can go and in and, and make an appointment and talk with the student that's embedded with that team the doctoral student that's embedded with that team we try to get county mental health and a lot of other people and you know people either want a lot of money for mental health services or they've got to be in some kind of title one or spa and it just was not we weren't getting the level of services we needed so we've tried to be innovative in that and how do we bring much needed services so a lot of these families um, are, are trauma is a victim I mean you know you hear that a lot right you got to be yeah. trauma aware but so having that ability now they can come and talk with people and help them figure out some of the stuff that's happened mm -hmm. so the deputies don't have to be involved in that right it's, right it's just over there and so the only time we get involved is obviously if they're suicidal or homicidal or right. the mandated reporting rules apply of course uh, and then um, we found out to be a huge asset because it's like we can actually start working with what's causing yeah causing I, thing will be I mean I, my experience of working with at-risk kids is in most cases they you just need a little bit more guidance, you know. I mean, and 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 if you intervene at the right time or in time, um, you know, it can be life changing. You know, a lot of people don't know the statistics with the homeless is that uh, once they reach, I think it's the age of twenty five, if they're still homeless or somewhere, it's somewhere around the mid twenties that uh, they they hit a circle of just continued homelessness. But if you intervene before then, particularly around the ages of seventeen, eighteen years old. Uh, for an at-risk youth that, that, that you can literally change their lives. Uh, there's there's a stat out there, and I, I honestly, I, at, the, at the moment, whether it's just I'm tired or I just forgot I'm just, <laughs> because I'm old, uh, I am the oldest candidate in this race. Are you really? <laughs> yeah, I, the first time ever I've been the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, there's a stat, and it's staggering. It's it's high percentage. Uh, it's well over 50% mm -hmm. of homeless come from foster care service. Yeah. Yeah, you I know, know that. Yeah, and, and the, the concept there is that uh, these kids, in fact, I love Blindside, the movie Blindside, mm -hmm. yeah. because he never had his own bed, right? And in, 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 in the show, in the movie, they, they kind of highlight that. Well, that's not that uncommon. Yeah. People don't realize uh, that show is, is trying to give all of us a heads up that, you know what, there's good kids yeah. walk around our streets that need your help. Yeah. And if we're blind to that, uh, oof, 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 oof. So like in Lancaster or up, up in that AV, I know we have 500 vets living in the dirt. Mm. Um, north of town, we have a whole encampment that's just mothers with children. Really? They're homeless mothers oh, with children. Geez. And so these are the things that, that push me a little bit. Like, okay, I want, I gotta, we gotta do something. I wanna do something to help this. Uh, and I realized, uh, in fact, I made this comment at a meeting. I said, I realize right now, I said, I don't need to be con a congressional person to do this right it, it doesn't matter if I if I get the Congress or not mm -hmm. me Mark Kripe can start working on this mm -hmm. now the candidacy's given me a voice you would not have ever asked me to be on your show if I wasn't a candidate no, I don't know I, 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 I truth to tell Katie Hill's first appearance when she right, she announced right when I had already asked her to be on that because she ran path uh, you know, yeah yeah, yeah big path I don't have any big corporate no, I, but but Pat, you know, it's, you know, a homeless mm -hmm. uh, organization, and I was going to talk to her about the homeless situation. So yeah, they're uh, building big, big home projects, big, you know, big yeah. dollar projects for homeless folks. Um, I think mainly veterans, isn't it? I don't know if it's state uh, the, veterans a, a or large, not. It's a from mix. what I understand, a large portion of it is, yeah, but it, that's not it, not the exclusive thing. Yeah, right. right. Uh, um, let's. I want to. Let's. It, we're we're already thirty minutes into this, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the reason you're here. You're ready for Congress. Um, you're a Republican. Have you always been a Republican? Yeah, I was born Republican, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I brought this up with Suzette, and I brought this up with uh, Mike Garcia. Uh, and I'll, when I talk to Angela Underwood Jacobs, I'll ask her the same thing. Um, but uh, to me, there are two types of Republicans. There's a traditional Republican, the one, the Reagan Republican. There's you know uh, George Will. There's uh, Bill Crystal and stuff like that, and then there's the Trump Republican, which those are two different people, the two different types of people. Okay. Uh, which one are you? Oh, I'd, I'd say I was a Reagan Marine. Okay. I mean, I remember the whole Howard Jarvis Prop 13. Mm -hmm. my, my my parents were big, you know, Reagan. Right. 
uh, folks, the the he Reagan was a great orator. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure he was. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's the that. way yeah. he spoke, the way he he said things to the country is what uh, motivated a country mm-hmm. to come together. Um, so it would have to. It would definitely have to be a. a a Reagan president or a Reagan a Reagan Republican, Republican. now I'll, I'm gonna give you this okay mm-hmm. disclaimer uh, I've been helping people in my community for the last 29 years in the yeah. department last 20 years at Vita mm-hmm. um, in my own private life whether it's through our church or just helping people that need help I have never once cared what Political affiliation, someone was right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, I get that about you. Yeah, I don't give. Uh, I don't. I don't make sure I don't swear. I don't. I don't give a darn <laughs> um, what your beliefs are. If you need help and you allow me to help you, mm-hmm. uh, and we develop a friendship, yeah. I really don't care. I, you can have whatever political belief you want to have. It can be opposing to mine. I don't care. Uh, I'm about the core person. If that makes sense to you, sure. I've never. You know, so what, what do you think about Donald Trump? As, as a- uh, you know, there's there's two things about Donald Trump you hear everyone talk about, and and Donald Trump presents a huge challenge, I think, for every Republican candidate out there, yeah. unless they're unless they're running in a deep, deep red state, mm-hmm. okay, where they can just go, okay. Um, there's things that he's doing for the country that I absolutely love. The he's helping the middle class. Some of his things, bringing back some uh, like the steel mills and some of the the union jobs and. These things, the, the tax cuts, I think it helped Midwest. It might have helped, but it didn't help us. It helped his base. It helped his base. Yeah. Uh, it kind of ignored his base here in California. Mm-hmm. Okay, but it did help. But California his... didn't carry Trump, so I mean, you know what I mean? It's like if you look, if you if you actually break down that tax cut, uh, uh, the majority of it went to people uh, to the states yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that that you know uh, Trump won. Well, and, and and people knew that going into it because yeah. there was comments. He's, he's going to hurt California and New York. Mm-hmm. So anybody that's pro-Trump in California or New York basically just braced to take the hit. Yeah. You know, this is coming. Now, to be honest with you, living in California as long, my whole life, yeah. we've been taking hits for a long time. <laughs> well, I mean, what, I mean what, but what do you think about him as a person and as a president? I mean, you're saying that he does some good things. But- so his, 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 some of the policies and some of the things he's doing, I like. Mm-hmm. Now, how he does them... Just, you know, I'm not into character assassinations. I'm not into, uh, uh, you know, the way he tweets. Yeah. Now, maybe he's got this phenomenal strategist or strategy and the way they do this and they set people up and they, they respond to this, you know, outrageous tweet yeah. and, and then he, boom, he just smashes them. Um, I couldn't do that. That's not me. I would simply, like, let's just take Baltimore. I would say, hey, Baltimore, we gave you a lot of money. Where's the money? You know, can someone maybe look at what's going on in Baltimore? We're trying to help that. We right. we instead of just going ah rat infested, you know right. whatever. Is he a racist? I don't think he's a racist. You don't think so? I don't think so. Um, I think that he. Uh, I don't know if there's a word for it, but he will character assassinate anybody. But I mean, a statement like "Go back to where you came from." Go back where you. Well, uh, he he was I think saying go back and fix some of these countries. You came here. You don't like America. Go back and fix there, your I mean, country. I, mean, you know, uh, I don't think it's a racist thing. I don't think it's plight. I don't think it's the decor well, we want to have. Let me have. ask you a question. Can you, could you st- walk up to a stranger uh, uh, of a person of color on the street and just say, go back to where you came from and have them go, okay. Well, first of all, I never would do that. But, I, okay. But, but why uh, not? I mean, it could, Well, because it's, it's, it's rude. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it, that I'm racist, racist against his race or his ethnicity. You, but that's not... See, it's not so much about how you perceive it. Well, that's it's how true. he perceives it. Now, I, well, so I'm asking. Uh, uh, yeah. how, I mean, unless he comes out and tells us how he's perceiving or wants it perceived. Well, how do you, how do you think uh, a person of color would perceive that? Oh, do you mean a person of color receive yeah. it? If you um, said, go back to where you came from. Uh, I, they're not going to like it. You know, I mean, well, I why not? Why I not? I wouldn't like it. You I mean, I was, you, you I was the minority in Europe. Okay, but you, right. So that's not a. But you're saying that's not a racist statement, though. But you're saying that they it, wouldn't like it. Like if I'm. So here's a great example. Okay. Uh, my wife and I are sitting in Austria, Innsbruck, uh-huh. Austria. Every Thursday night, they got the Zoom Paw band that goes by. Yeah. Americans act like asses over there. Yeah. Okay. I was embarrassed to be an American by most American behavior. 
So when Austrians said, I wish they would go back to where they came from, mm -hmm. they weren't being racist. What they were doing was that behavior is just bad but and I, we don't want it here. I would counter by saying that the history of this country in particular uh, with race and uh, that comment itself is incredibly associated with racism. We have, we have a, 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 a history some have tried to bury, but we have a history that is definitely not, mm -hmm. not good, okay? Um, not kind, mm -hmm. not inclusive, mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt. Uh, I would rather have us teach that history to everybody mm -hmm. so we're aware of it, right? Mm -hmm. We're aware that, you know what, we can be better than that. Okay. We can be better than that. So when we talk about Trump, my mindset is I'd like to see him be better than that. Yeah. Now, mind you, I'm not at that level where maybe they've got some you know, strategy and they're trying to set people up or whatever. But if we look at behaviors, there's behaviors I don't like in people. Yeah. Now, one of the things I, in fact, in my book, we'll whoop, talk about them. <laughs> um, I say this, affirm a person, confront the behavior. Mm -hmm. Right, you can have a behavior I absolutely detest, mm -hmm. but I'm going to affirm you. I'm going to separate the two right. because I want you to feel valued, feel like you matter. That's my message. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I might not like the behavior. Are, the, are, are you, as, as far as being a Republican, you say you're a Reagan, Reagan Republican. Uh, are there any policies that the uh, Republican Party uh, and Trump are doing right now that you don't approve of, or that you would do differently? Or that you would vote against? Absolutely. The, the, the stuff on the border. You wouldn't do that? Well, I would do it differently. How would you do it? One is um, I wouldn't move children thousands of miles away from their parents. Okay? Some of the detention facilities that they're holding the children are thousands of miles. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. I would, I would, I would do everything I could to convert a facility uh, where if I have to separate, which I get why they're separating the minors. I, I understand that. Why are they separating? Why? why? Um, Basically, we're trying to find out who's who in the zoo, and we know we're getting children that are being sex, sex trafficked through through there. Do you think? I mean, yes. You think it's that many? Well, there's a report that said uh, three out of ten. Okay, three out of ten is too many. Now, well, I, there's, one there's, out of ten is too many. There, yeah, know, yeah. There's this. There was a six-year-old girl, and I don't think it made the papers, but there was a six-year-old girl found yeah. at the border. Mm -hmm. She was unconscious when the border patrol found her. Yeah. They took her to the medical facility. Yeah. They start trying to figure out what's wrong. Mm -hmm. They realized that she had been sexually assaulted. Yeah. They do a rape kit. They found 20 samples of semen in her. Oh, jeez. Okay. So this, as a law enforcement officer, this stuff's going on. You say one's too many. Trust me, it's a lot more than one. We know that they're ab our moral value of how to treat children is not shared with a lot of people south that border. Well, okay, but, so, but I, what moral value do we have if we're pulling kids from parents? Well, one is, families? one is we're gonna DNA check, make sure it's actually a biological child, okay. which I'm glad they're doing that. Once you know that, get them back to the okay. parent. Now, I wouldn't move, during that process, I wouldn't move them 1,000 miles away. Right. I would make it to where they get, you're separated, but I can see mom and dad, mom and dad can see me, mm -hmm. you know, a glass barrier, uh, just some kind of barrier that keeps us apart until they, so no one gets victimized, but we can see each other. Okay. It would be tremendously less impacting on the minor mm -hmm. and the parent, right? Now, some of these parents, in fact, oh, that's in the truck. I, I, I brought for the ACL. I, I printed out the ACLU's report. Mm -hmm. Some of these parents are completely just signing over custody to the United States. Just here's here's my kid. I'm going back. Uh, well, I'm, I. I <laughs> And that's the ACLU report. I, yes, but the way you're phrasing it, it sounds like they're giving up their kid because they want to get rid of their kid. I mean, it's it's not the case. I got three kids. Right. There's no way in hell I'll ever give my right, kid up. Right, right. I mean, if I have but, to go back, I'm taking my babies with there, me. Uh, the reports I have read uh, uh, state that in a lot of cases, there have been situations where they have sent the parents home or, or had them sign a thing and sent them home and not given the kid back to them. Or they can't find the kid even. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, because we, they, the, the records don't even, they, they don't even know where, to, where, where some uh, of these kids are. I mean, how do you find a two-year, how does a two-year-old tell you where mommy and daddy are, you know? You know, I mean. No, that, you're exactly right. Yeah. And, 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 um, and we've been wrestling, we've been wrestling with this challenge of mm -hmm. minors at the border 
Um, I think what 1993 it was Flores um, versus Reno. Mm -hmm. I believe is what the the original case I, was. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, uh, Reno being Janet Reno, she was the, the but Flores versus Reno is is was one of the first landmark cases where we started wrestling with this. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on the internet um, going back to between um, President Obama and on, on to Trump. Uh, because President Obama, if you remember, he was wrestling with unaccompanied minors. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. He, he, whew, you just a flood of kids coming at you. How, how does how does? Whew. So uh, yeah, I would I would do the, that differently to try to understanding the the impact on families. I try to okay, if I got to separate, at least you can see each other. Like if you yeah. you have children. Yes. All right, so we go into a country illegally. You, you know, we got our family, your family, um, and they, we know they're going to detain us. I would at least want to know my kids right there. Mm -hmm. Right, you take my you take my kids a thousand miles away. It's a whole different psychological impact. I, yeah, but I think um, in some cases, I think a lot of those, considering the circumstances, a lot of these parents and, and these families are going through in, the, in their in their own countries, and they're, um. they're leaving. To come to America for uh, better opportunities. I, I'm of the type to believe that these parents that might be surrendering their kids uh, uh, to to the United States and going back to their own countries is more of a hope and belief that because the kids in America, they're going to have a better life than going back to where they came from. Well, you and I share that, but that's that's an, uh, we're looking through optics with optimism and mm, and, trying and to. we want to we want to think the best of these people. Sure. Now we have in the United States ourselves, mm -hmm. we're tracking thrown away children. Yeah. Okay, not runaway. The actual title in the FBI database is thrown away. Yeah. Um, there's some things that we need to do better. One is a, a country. Lot of things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As a country, uh, you know, families is that that's why families one of my three things in my campaign. Uh, we can do so much better with that. So that's just one of uh, things that I would probably do different, right. right? Is is I would you can do the right thing the wrong way. People that know me have know I've been saying that for decades. Right. You can do the right thing the wrong way, and so how do we do the right thing the right way? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's key. Right. Um, and I would like that the way we do things, especially on an international level at our international borders, mm -hmm. I would like to be able to say, yeah, that's just like us. That's just like the United States. We're caring, compassionate, wealthy. Uh, you're going to have one of the nicest uh, in-dock facilities. Um, they're going to care for your needs. You're going to get medically screened, mm -hmm. medically evaluated, um, processed. They're going to make sure your child is your child mm -hmm. uh, simply to protect all the children coming mm -hmm. across. But do it in a way that it's not... Uh, inhumane? Yeah, inhumane. You know, I used that, uh, I used that word uh, a while back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, like, we need to stop treating people like they're stock animals. I agree. I agree. So, of course, the Marine Corps, we, that's, you know, mm -hmm. but I think we're, I think as a country, I think we should be bigger and better than that. Were you a supporter of Trump when he was running? I voted for Carson in the primary. Did you? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I voted, I voted, uh, I voted against Hillary. Okay. <laughs> as most Republicans will say. And well, I, I mean, that's, you yeah. know, um, I, 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 I mm, yeah. I couldn't go there. So it wasn't like I was sold out on, on, on President Trump. Would you um, vote for him again if there was another Republican running against him? I mean, there is, but I mean, would, is Trump's, are you like all gung ho for Trump now as president, or is it because he's a Republican candidate? Do you know what I mean? Well, the here's, the, here's the problem um, I'm not even aware of the Republican candidate who's running against him. Uh, Bill Weld uh, is one, and I think um, Mark. Uh, Sanford, I think, if I'm giving this so name. So two of them, huh? Yeah, possibly. He's, I think he's considering it. I think I got his name it's, right. It's amazing that the, yeah. you know, I'm like, I'm running for Congress, and it's like, I don't, someone's, someone's running against Trump? What? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, how, how like Simple I said. Question. Would you vote for him again? I would probably vote for him again. You think he's doing that good a job? Uh, I think, I think. I would love to take his Twitter away. So I'll vote for you and take your Twitter away. Yeah. You know, and you, I know you hear that a lot. Yeah. Because everyone's saying it. Yeah. Um, he uses his Twitter like a, like a weapon. Yeah. And he's good at it. Okay. I would never do that. That's mm -hmm. not the way I, I roll. But uh, he's, he sets people up and they bite. And, uh, but probably the, the, you know, we have the most, what, it's a, in my lifetime, yeah. the lowest unemployment, uh, the most blacks back to work. 
I think in my lifetime. I and mean, when you look at some of the stats, they're really hard to say, oh yeah, that's, that's in that. Um, I like that. I, we need to get the middle class mm-hmm. back. We need to get all these people back to work. And, and you know, my own kids, and, and uh, I have a little bit of understanding of how hard the job market is, not from me anymore. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be retired here. Yeah. But my own kids and, and you know, um, my oldest daughter's 28, my son's 25, and, mm-hmm. and uh, my youngest is 22. So they're right in that age frame where they're like, hey, it's hard to get medical. It's hard, yeah. It's yeah, hard yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. So um, if he can continue to do uh, helping the middle class and building that, the question is how much do you tolerate? Right, right. Well... <laughs> Uh, it's already been three years, and it feels like twenty to me. <laughs> uh, well, I get a feeling we'd probably be on opposite sides no, of the aisle. Anybody, anybody that's heard the show knows I'm not a fan of Trump. It's yeah, got yeah, nothing yeah, yeah. to do with uh, being Republican or, 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 or party affiliation. Well, it's got I'll everything be honest with him. Um, I don't like being a fan. I don't like that. I don't even like the idea of being a fan of any politician. Mm-hmm. Okay, because. Uh, I, I'm I'm loyal to the office, yeah. Office of the president. Okay, I get that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. I, I was a Marine Corps, right? I mean, yeah. Okay, sure. so Commander in Chief. Uh, even when Obama was there, the things I didn't like about Obama, I still like my wife. She, I said, "You give the office the respect it's sure. due." Absolutely. Period. Yeah. Okay. We can talk about things you don't like. That's fine. But you will. We will give. Just like with the sheriff, I've been on five sheriffs. So, like, if you're loyal to one sheriff, then the new right. sheriff comes in. Well, guess what? They want to because. Your loyalty was with the old guy, not them. You give the office the loyalties. Mm-hmm. The, the, so the office of the sheriff is where my uh, loyalty lied. Mm-hmm. Whoever's in that office gets the same loyalty. Right. Okay? Now, some of them you like more, some of them you like less. Does that make sense? Because mm-hmm. some align with you more, some align with you less, your, your optics. So um, Obama was well-spoken. Yeah. He, would, he could speak, you know, he could offend people and they would smile and say thank you. <laughs> Everybody knows. I, I know a couple of people who have met him, and they they just say he's he comes across as the coolest guy in the room. You know, it just he's got that vibe. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? And, and Trump's got that billionaire New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's my way or the highway. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, and I knew I knew I knew that before I voted for him. I mean, it's like he's okay. He's from I've been in New York. Yeah. Okay, he's a New York billionaire. Yeah. So a lot of these things, everyone goes, "Oh, look at." Okay, yeah, it's, it come, that's part and parcel to a New York billionaire business guy. Yeah. I mean, come on. We're not naive, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, Nick, you got another question? Yeah, I got lots. Keep going. All right, well, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about policy. Uh, right, Susan, uh, this is for you. Uh, Susan Watker is always on my case about not asking enough about health care. Um, would you have voted, as Steve Knight did, to repeal the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act? Uh, I probably would. Why? Um, because it's a disaster. Why is it a disaster? Uh, right thing, wrong way. Um, people's costs went up. I mean, and here's the here's the the bad some, thing. Some people's costs went up, though. And, and that's the bad thing, right? Mm-hmm. There's no win. No matter what no, you, that, see, there, you you repeal it, you hurt some, you help some. You keep it, you hurt some, you help some. So, and that's politics. It's, it's almost impossible to come across with, with a thing that is going to help everybody. But see, my daughter, 28, she aged out of my insurance at 26. Mm-hmm. Okay? She cannot afford the exchanges. We've tried. We've looked. The cost, but she had coverage until she was 26 because of the Affordable Care Act. And I like, see, we like that. Okay. See, so I'm not saying like, oh, you got to repeal it because it's just all crap. Mm-hmm. No, you got to fix it. But to fix it, uh, you're going to remodel a house. You gotta tear stuff out. You gotta. You gotta. There's demo involved in that before you can start rebuilding. Okay. So what? What? What is your alternative to it? <sighs> I would love to sit here and say, "Oh, I got a great alternative." I. My alternative is get people in there that know medical care. Um, I think reducing costs. How do we reduce costs? Okay. Um, I would love to have uh, insurance coverage. Mm-hmm. Be like auto insurance. Your insurance is good no matter where you're at in the United States. Okay. Okay. Instead and of I you go, to, that's you, kind of the way most insurance is, isn't it? I mean, well, some of them is, is if you go out a certain area, you're not covered. Okay. Okay. I've never, I personally never experienced that. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, um, uh, big pharma, right? The mm-hmm. cost of medical stuff. Now, I get the 
R&D of some of these drugs is right. high. Right. And they're going to pass it down. But um, some of these pills are pennies to make, and we're paying you know hundreds of dollars to get per pill. Right. I think Trump just did a uh, executive order to get Canadian prescriptions. Yeah. Okay. Good or bad, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, my my wife's a neonatal NICU nurse, mm -hmm. so the the medical thing. Trust me, is like da 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 da. Yeah. She, I mean, she's on me all the time about yeah. the medical thing. Um, what what about? I like the twenty six. In fact, here's my thing. I would love if I qualify for insurance and I can I can pay for it. Mm -hmm. How come I can't bring people on my policy that aren't my? I say I want these on my. I'm going to cover for them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I was a business owner, I could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe some exchanges. I love, uh, I'm a union guy. I love unions. Um, the thing with unions is they, you get benefits. Mm -hmm. the, the more union jobs we have, the less of these problems we're going to have with people getting medical You know, medical I had to tell you, Mark, you, you don't talk like a Republican. Oh, I know that. You, you talk sound, like a re Democrat, right? Uh, I would say I'm, I'm a conservative Democrat, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you you you, you have issues with healthcare, uh, <laughs> but uh, but I like the idea of. I mean, uh, a lot of, a lot of what you said. I mean, even even um, the things about the Obamacare thing is uh, similar to some what some of the presidential candidates have said. You know, I mean, I, and I haven't listened to one debate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, Joe Biden has said that you know let's not tear down Obamacare. Let's fix some of the problems with it. It's a start, and you know, it's a marker. So and I've so. told people this. Here's my thing: is okay. Um, the left and the right have been at each other for my entire mm -hmm. life. Okay, you can go through the names. Right. You know, uh, the the solution's always in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, we'll compromise, we'll come to the middle. Well, 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 you know, it's just tug of war. But the solution usually is always in the middle. The solution that helps the people, that helps our district. Right. So for me, one of the things I've been telling people, like what you were talking about, um, uh, the shirts I'm going to have, uh, I want. Team 25 or, or mm -hmm. some about the 25th district on my campaign shirt because mm -hmm. the campaign's not about me, yeah. it's about the district. And in the district, mm -hmm. we have people, we have a diverse population in our district, right? But yeah, I here, but let me let's go back to the a, uh, ACA for just a second here okay. by voting against it. I mean, you, you were possibly throwing thousands of people oh, wow. that, that, that off of, of insurance, which that I would not want to do, yeah. Is it one of those evils that's like, okay, now here's the thing I didn't like. Yeah. It was supposed to be what? Repeal? And replace. And replace. They've never come up with any plan. Okay, so so the people got screwed on this, mm -hmm. but the idea was repeal and replace. Right. If you repeal... Replace or something. Yeah. That's the only that's the only solution that, okay, they have insurance, we're going to... We're gonna, okay. Uh, that didn't happen. Yeah. That didn't happen. And therefore now it takes that vote to repeal... And, and, and hurts everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know I, I know Steve Knight. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, friend of the show. Okay, he's, he's good good guy. I guarantee you, he never in his heart he never wanted to hurt people or hurt their insurance. I don't think I, I've never thought that about. Uh, yeah, yeah. Knight. That, it's just I, not it's not in I, in the wheelhouse, and it's not my wheelhouse. Different philosophy about uh, about the way. How do you get it done? Yeah. It, d does the Affordable Care Act need to be fixed? Does it need to be adjusted, molded? It absolutely does. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that lost their insurance. You know how many times you hear that? So, oh, if you like your doctor, you can keep it. Well, you can't. Keep you know, your I, you know, I, I would counter that by saying, you know. The bill itself was what uh, thousands of pages, and and it's one sixth of the economy. There are going to be hiccups and bumps, <laughs> and there are going to be problems with things. You, um, why are you laughing? What is it? Uh, well, it's just like you know, one sixth of the economy. Yeah, it, it is. They created a monster. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is that you know, when Obama said that you know you'll be able to keep your own doctor and everything like that, I'm sure he perfect. He thought exactly that was what was going to happen, but you know. When the thing got enacted, it just it it was like a hiccup, you know, kind of a wave of uh, change, and, and I things th ha happened unintentionally. You know, I think some of those people knew it was a boondoggle, mm -hmm. um, but they were by then they're pot committed. But you know, I, I don't know who. Yeah. But I mean, when they went like this, you have to approve it before you can read it. You have to vote for it before you can read it. Yeah. No, well, no they didn't always say that. It's just that it. Most people don't read the bills. I mean, Congress. Oh, yeah, they do. But I mean, yeah. they they wouldn't even open it up until it was approved yeah. or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. There was something about hey, uh, anybody that says you got to buy this before you can look at it, mm -hmm. you and I just on the street, we're gonna go. Oh no, thank you. Yeah. 
It, it, all the bells go but you, off. But you know, uh, here's, here's what goes through my mind about the Affordable Care Act. You know, I mean, you talk about costs going up. Mike Garcia said that same thing, that it you know, wasn't affordable and that you know, his costs had gone up and everything like that. Joe Messina, friend of the show, uh, had talked about the fact that his granddaughter, I think it was his granddaughter he mentioned when I was talking to him about it, uh, that, uh, and this is on record, so it's not like I'm talking out of school. But, <laughs> uh, he said this on a podcast. Um, but uh, he talked about how her bills, I mean, her medical bills that he was now paying were much more expensive because of the Affordable Care Act. But what went through my mind was, Joe, you have a nationally syndicated show. You probably can afford it. Sorry, Joe. But uh, <laughs> and and, I, and conversely, I know a friend a friend of mine uh, specifically who is diabetic has never been able to get insurance ever. Mm. Was credit carding her di- her insulin, you know, to to to, to, so, to live. But now, because of the Affordable Care Act, she's able to get insulin, get insurance, and uh, and and afford to live. And so I mean, you know, you know good I mean? good for her. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean that's, that's a that's a, a good direct deal. Result of the Affordable Care Act, though. Uh, one of the other things I hated about the Affordable Care Act is if you can't afford to get insurance, we're going to fine you on your taxes. So if the people can't afford it, why are we going to why are we going to charge them more? Well, money? I mean, that never made I, sense. I don't, I don't want to be a defender of the Affordable Care Act. I will tell you that yeah. you know the Supreme Court did rule it's constitutional. Uh, I mean, so and it, it, it is un, uh, as long as it's a tax. Well, that's it, why so much went through the IRS. Well, okay, because it was going to be unconstitutional unless it was. Tax. John Roberts saw it as a tax. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could argue that it is a tax, it just is, or a penalty, or whatever it is. And know? some will argue that it was never, it never went back to Congress to get ratified as a tax. Mm. Um, so then it's like, well, okay, well, that means the whole, the whole thing is unconstitutional. And you hear all these arguments, and of course, you can go all the way back that our federal income tax mm-hmm. it was never ratified when they moved it from a war tax to an income tax. So therefore, that's unconstitutional. That's why I just don't pay anything. <laughs> but trust oh, me, no, no. I, I'm I, paying I, enough I, for I both of us. Taxes. I pay my taxes. I want to emphasize that. Don't come after me. Um, so, uh, but um, yeah, I'm dev- I mean, I'm I vote conservative. I always have. Yeah. Uh, I I believe in accountability. I believe in the law. I believe hey, uh, the, there's there's a time to hold people responsible, um, but I want to make sure that they they have help to do the right thing the right way. Mm-hmm. Okay. But not fervously. Yeah. Okay, I'm not just going to throw. You know, it's like uh, there's a great passage. Um, uh, are, are you are you you go to church at all? No. Okay. Well, there's a book that a lot of religions use. I won't. <laughs> I am familiar with it. <laughs> you familiar with that book? Yes. Okay. So there's a story in the Bible uh, about Jesus seeing people and he had compassion mm-hmm. and he turns to his disciples. He says they're like sheep downcast without a shepherd. And I never knew what that term downcast actually meant. Mm-hmm. And I was on patrol one day, and, you know, up in the Anno Valley, we used to have Basque shepherds out there right. doing stuff. So I pull in, of course, I think the guy, I scared, scared him to death because, you know, hey, can you? Anyway, so he, I had him teach me what a downcast sheep is. And a, a downcast sheep is a sheep that lays down to get rest or whatever. And they inadvertently roll into a divot because the earth's not perfectly groomed. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. we like to groom all of our stuff, but in raw land, it's not groomed. Right. And the sheep will just kind of roll back. And well, the sheep's stuck. If it doesn't have a shepherd, it's stuck there. It's going to get killed. Mm-hmm. So my mindset is this. We have downcast sheep. We know we have downcast sheep. Okay, for whatever reason. Some of the homeless people, it's not, they, they don't want to be homeless, but that's what they got. Yeah. And that's what they're going to live with. Okay. So some people would just come by and just feed the sheep. Just take care of its needs and leave it there. I want to get the sheep back on its feet mm-hmm. so it can be productive in society and become a contributing member. The, uh, the idea that... Uh Sheep people should be, uh, pull themselves up, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, but they don't necessarily have the bootstraps yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, Mel and I did the whole we're going to do this with our own bootstraps thing, mm-hmm. but we got a car, right? We said, oh, yeah, that I need, I I can use that. Um, would have been nice. Well, here's the thing: you say, okay, well, we didn't use any wick. I couldn't even get to the wick office without that car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I believe you. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I want if if our mindsets to help our district, mm. the the bantering all this other stuff becomes kind of a mute. So point. you would reach across the aisle. You have no. Oh, idea. absolutely. You, you would not. Uh, you would vote district over party. Uh, I would definitely. Uh, now I realize there's going to be pressure. Parties are going to put mm. pressure on you to do these things. 
even Katie mentioned it. You know, there's there's things where the, she reaches across the aisle, but there's things where they say, okay, you're going to vote this way, right. or we're trying to drive this thing through. So that's politics. I get that, but I I would I'm asking to go to Congress for my district, okay, not for the party. So always district over party, correct? Well, you want to you want to throw the word always in there, and I I'm gonna say I'm hoping always. I got to recognize that if the party comes in and say this, we're going to drive this, and this is going to be this. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to actually make a choice at that point in time. What's What's best for me, our district, and the party? Constitution over the district. You swore an oath twice. Uh, the Constitution should should be that should should be an either or. You know, we should Const- we should we should be able to support the con defend the Constitution, and serve our district at the same time. Well, it be but, or. but well, let's talk about impeachment for a moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, this district is purple. Um, there is a large, and I think the reason Katie Hill has not come out for impeachment is because it's a purple district. There are a lot of people that would not want her to support impeachment. Um, but if did you read the Mueller report? I didn't read it. Um, mm-hmm. I've read a lot of the the rebut or the comments, mm-hmm. or the, but I haven't read word for word the entire. Ten counts of obstruction of justice. Over a thousand prosecuting uh, attorneys. Hang on now. Yeah. Um, Okay, keep going. Okay. Over a thousand prosecuting attorneys, both Republican and Democrat, have signed a letter saying that anybody else would be uh, tried for obstruction of justice based on these charges in the Mueller report. Okay. Um, I'm not even saying he's guilty, but I'm saying that there's enough evidence there in the Mueller report to bring impeachment hearings, wouldn't you say? So when we talk about obstruction, first of all, I'd like to read everything, but obviously attorneys are attorneys. They, yeah. They're usually pretty savvy on some of this. Um, the the thing with the Mueller report, like when, when Mueller testified, mm. he didn't know anything about Fusion GPS, right? Well, he I, said. I, 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 I think, sadly, I think uh, Mueller is uh, showing signs of age. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what he didn't but know. That doesn't mean his attorney, the, his staff, didn't know. I mean, I think my guess is Mueller picked a really great team behind him. And he you think kind of, he picked it or was picked for him? I don't know. Because I, if he's that senile, he didn't pick that team. Well, I don't think he's that senile. I just don't think he's up to par to what he was six years ago. You know, um, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, there's things in that mm-hmm. that Congress asked him he couldn't, he couldn't answer. Right. Now, here's... here's so... And the reason I, I bring Fusion GPS up, right. it's the catalyst for all of these things, mm-hmm. right? It's, no, no, it's, no, no, it's no, a catalyst. No, it's true. a catalyst for the for the conclu- the collusion. No, no. The Steele no, dossier is not no, the catalyst. No, it is not. The Steele that is that is a uh, <laughs> propaganda thing. Um, you think so? Yes. And and they present it to the FISA court to get a warrant to no, wiretap. No, no, no. no. Uh, Carter Page, the FISA court situation with Carter Page. Uh, Carter Page had been known uh, to work with the Russians on several occasions. Okay. Uh, George Pop- Papadopoulos, if I'm getting, actually yep. was the one that s- spoke to uh, uh, I believe he was an Australian professor or diplomat or something, and said, "You wouldn't believe what's going on with Russia and the Trump campaign." Told him that while they were in a drunken thing, and that guy went to the FBI and said, "This is what a guy from the Trump campaign told me about." That's what opened the Russian investigation, the Steele dossier and Fusion GPS was actually started by a Republican uh, opponent of Trump's when that opponent, I don't even know who it is, but um, um, stopped out of the election. It was passed on to the Clinton campaign. They said, do you, they asked him, do you want it? And they said, yes, we'll take a look at it. That is that is a fact. Those are facts. Um, the, Trump, the Trump people have been pushing it the other direction. But the whole FISA thing and Fusion GPS had nothing to do with the actual Russian investigation that started uh, on collusion. Now, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about obstruction. I'm talking, I mean, yeah, 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 so, yeah. so let's just take one example, okay? Um, uh, the, the White House attorney, uh, Don McGahn, um, telling him to fire Mueller and then telling him to uh, change records to make it look like, you know, he didn't tell him that. Now McGahn went on went on at under oath, which would be perjury if he's lying, saying this happened. Now that's first of all that is clearly obstruction, 
And um, Trump says McGahn's lying. So that to me says there's something there. So let me ask you this. How come Mueller's team didn't indict? Because according to Justice, uh, a mem- uh, Justice Department memo, uh, uh, presidents cannot be indicted. Okay, but, uh, you, but uh, you just presidents. talked about several people that were not pr- the president mm-hmm. that are lying or could be lying or have perjured themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, how come none of those people have been indicted? Well, Papadopoulos served time. Uh, none of it, none of it all, all the crimes that they've actually prosecuted mm-hmm. were, were, had nothing to do with the collusion case. Would okay. you agree? It had to do with IRS or lying. They're all peripheral. What were they lying about? Why were they lying? I mean, I, that's what I don't get. I mean, well, I, I think there's a lot of. I think every administration since I've been born is is tells mistruths or lies or whatever. It's it's a sleight of hand. Do you think every, Do you think Washington's completely honest with the people? No. Regardless of what president, regardless of what administration. You know, is, no, I don't think they're ever completely honest. Yeah, so and that's a problem. That's a problem for us. So, um, if if I get the whole idea of a setting president, right? They they give a setting president this this leeway. Every president's gotten that leeway. Now, when he leaves office, is somebody going to indict him? I don't know. We'll see, right? Um, Nixon. Did Nixon ever get indicted? Uh, he was brought to him. He, they, they were about to. Uh, about to yeah, yeah, and then he he resigned in lieu of. Yeah, yes. Yep. Never, never prosecuted. But but the interesting thing is though, if you break down uh, the, a lot of what Nixon, the paper, the indictment, well, not the indictments, but the impeachment was being brought forth for, was obstruction of justice, on levels that are not even close to what Trump has been doing, according to the Mueller report. So. But, We'll agree to disagree on this, but I will ask you this. Uh, just if there was an impeachment hearing and you're in Congress and he's your president, he's a Republican, and you look at the evidence, are you going to be able to look at it and go, okay, I'm party over a constitution over party? Uh, he's violated the constitution, he's obstructed justice. Could you vote yeah, for if the evidence? If the evidence is there, yeah, if the evidence is there. And it's not, I mean, it's solid evidence. And mm-hmm. being in Congress, mm-hmm. I'm hoping that you get to look at the real thing, yeah. not, not someone's, you know, uh, yeah. opinion of the real thing, but look at the evidence mm-hmm. and say, based on this evidence, this is what we have to do. Okay. Um, because that's, that's the role of Congress. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, it's in the Constitution. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it, part of that is this oversight for whoever's president. Right, whether it's it's uh, and and here's the thing is it's like okay, well, would Democrats in and I'm not saying there ever was anything to impeach Obama. Just saying, would they have impeached Obama? Yes or no? Um, and then what? We look, we impeached Clinton, right? Yeah. What what good did that do? What well, did, what did it change? I, not much of anything. And, and, and <laughs> I mean, if, any, if anything, I mean, it just uh, well, I mean. I think Clinton did a lot less than what uh, the, the Mueller report But he says. still got impeached. Yes. My, my point is, I think if, um, I think if, the, if the shoe was on the other foot and if Clinton was president, if Hillary Clinton was president or Obama was president, and the em- evidence that has come out, um, the same type of stuff that has come out about in the Mueller report about Trump, uh, the Republicans would be having a field day on for it. Well, the, 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 and I share this with the right. The right's extremely frustrated. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, now we can say people are spinning this left or spinning it right, but yeah. they're extremely frustrated mm-hmm. because uh, they absolutely perceive this as a double standard in in, in the justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're just not even involved in Trump, okay? Um, Hillary Hillary email servers things that her smashing that stuff. Um, the the there's many things that have. That have gone down that we don't they don't understand why these things didn't get prosecuted Mm -hmm. Um, that's a problem I mean that's it's a huge problem when you try to hide too much stuff from the people the people are going to get very suspicious and cynical Mm -hmm. right or left right and what's happened now is 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 we've driven our country into this argument that in my opinion is asinine Mm -hmm. Okay, we're 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 picking like two gladiators in, in a thing and betting on them, and and going all in, 
and destroying friendships, lifelong friendships, over stuff that we don't really know what's happening. Um, I remember the Bush and the Clintons, you know, all the campaigning, whatever. And then after their, you see them as friends. They've yeah. been friends they their whole good life. Friends. They became good friends. Yeah. They might have been friends before. And, 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 and another strange one is uh, George W. Bush and Michelle Obama are apparently besties. So, so, so I, I take a step back and I go, okay, what's really going on here? Is our, our you know, um, I, I want to see justice done. I want to see the Constitution upheld. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I also don't want to see our country ripped apart. Yeah, it, I would not want to be uh, Nancy Pelosi because uh, it, it just she's in a real tough situation right now as, as far as what because it will. I mean, I, I I'll acknowledge that the impeachment will drive this country into almost a, an actual civil war. But um, what year did Reagan get uh, elected? Eighty. Eighty. Yeah. So I was sixteen. Yeah. Okay. I was sixteen. Uh, you realize uh, Pelosi's been in Congress since Reagan. Uh, no, that's not correct. I thought he called her corrupt. No, 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 no. She uh, was, uh, I think she came in after uh, Clarence Thomas, which was a George W. A George Bush nominee. So I think she was uh, 93, 90, 92, somewhere around there. I don't, I'm not positive on that. Yeah, I'll have to look that up because yeah. uh, I saw a thing is she's been in uh, so 80, 88, right? Reagan left in 88, mm -hmm. elected 80, 88, uh, but... It was after. It was after. It's my understanding she was elected uh, first elected after the Anita Hill hearings. Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to Google that when I get back and see. But she's been there a long time. She has been there a long time. <laughs> a lot of presidents. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, is there any Republican president that Democrats haven't tried to impeach in your lifetime? That they haven't tried to impeach. Well, they never tried to impeach Reagan. They never tried to impeach uh, Ford. They never tried to impeach uh, George Bush. George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, you know, at George W. Bush, there was talk about it after the Iraq War, um, but you know, I mean, I don't think there's been a situation like what with the Mueller report, like since uh, the Nixon situation. Let me ask you this: Is this going to be the thing in the future where? Regardless, I, it, it is. It is a fear of mine, and and, I, and, and the one everybody's going to try to impeach the other yeah, president. Yeah, I well. I, I, I think this is a little bit different, um, but let's let's move on. Um, okay. <laughs> let's uh, we've got about ten minutes left here, so I'm going to ask you uh, just point blank: um, what 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 is Katie Hill doing wrong that you feel that you need to replace her? Uh, I'm not going to say she's doing anything wrong. Okay. Um, first of all, she's been there six months, so there's 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 things I didn't like that she did. I think I would have done different. Like. Okay. Um, I would have voted for the humanitarian aid. I wouldn't have voted left of Maxine Waters like she did. She voted against the, the aid thing um, for whatever reason. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to set up talk about why did you vote no on that. As my understanding is because it was more of a blank check and there was no guarantee <clears throat> that the humanitarian aid would actually go to the, uh, uh, the uh, Im uh, immigrants. Yeah, I read, the, I read the, the synopsis of the bill. Some, sometimes, you know, at our level, we don't mm -hmm. get to see the whole narrative and what nonsense is in, involved in it. But... Um, yeah, that's, I mean, obviously, you know, you got a lot of, uh, Maxine Waters is voting for it. There's other people voting for it. It's like, okay, maybe we just go with this. But she voted against that. Um, she's, she's in Democrat leadership. I heard her on your, on your show, right? She's, she's there. I would really like to see her speak out against the, the, at least maybe somehow check some of the, the youngsters that are doing the anti-Semitic stuff, some of the. Hate stuff. I don't. I don't think. Um, I, I don't. I, I think that that's being pushed as anti-Semitic necessarily. Uh, I mean, for for what has been said, that it's been anti-Semitic. Uh, 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 Ilan Omar, I believe her name is, uh, has apologized for. Uh, I think, and I uh, and I think her issue is more about Israel and the money um, involved with lobbying and stuff like that, and. Uh, and our support of Israel without taking into account uh, the situation with the Palestinians. That I think is, mo but it's being construed as anti-Semitic because a lot of people, and my wife's Jewish, so I just, you know, put that out there <laughs> beforehand. Um, but there are a lot of people that, that seem to feel that if you are 